Uh, thank you very much for the generous introduction and uh, many thanks to the organizers for the uh, invitation. Uh, it's an honor to be here among such esteemed uh, colleagues. Um, I would like to um, share my screen with you. Okay, great. Um, the title is uh, slightly misleading. Um, since it's only an instance uh, from Soviet science fiction from the 70s that I'm going to discuss here today. However, some general comments may uh, come from this. Already in the 1960s, a special subgenre had developed within the genre of science fiction that touched upon aspects of nature and future habitation. Early on, literary and cinematic works thematized the various moral and ethical dilemmas posed by rapid technological progress. Researchers now distinguish between three interlocking narrative trends in this tradition. The first, and probably most common, pertains to the construction of a post-apocalyptic narrative universe where usually earthbound protagonists struggle to survive. On some level, uh, Tarkovsky's stalker experiments with the narrative conventions of this trend, utilizing an earthly post-apocalyptic dystopia as the setting for the action. However, this paper will examine stalker as a message of hope for the future, a coded utopia veiled behind the layers of decay and ruination that characterized the architecture of the movie. In other words, this paper will propose an alternative reading of the movie, one that foregrounds the primacy of space in the construction of a potent philosophical argument about utopia. Soviet science fiction is linked to the rise of interwar modernity and reflects the enthusiasm generated by the October Revolution. Stalin's death and the launch of Sputnik I marked the outset of the Zahner's post-war thematic and expressive renewal. Khrushchev's reformations and the Cold War space race, a constant source of pride for the Soviet society throughout the 60s, particularly after Gagarin's Vostok I success, paved the way for the second golden age of Soviet science fiction. Uh, this fresh rise to prominence of Soviet science fiction was accompanied by a restored interest in technology and at the same time an increasing skepticism against a high-tech artificial future world. Roadside Picnic, the science fiction novel by Boris and Arkady Strugatsky that provided the groundwork onto which Stalker was loosely based, was released in 1971 against this promising background. Having said that, it should be noted that the rich output of the 60s and the 70s was not limited to aspects of technological progress and the conquest of outer space. However, a more wide-ranging investigation of the Zanor is beyond the scope of this limited presentation. Arkady Strugatsky worked as a teacher and English and Japanese translator for the military until, until the early 50s, when he began his successful collaboration with his younger brother, Boris uh, Strugatsky. Boris Strugatsky was an astronomer and a computer engineer, which I think is relevant to our discussion. Together, they produced some of the most popular works Soviet science fiction and earned worldwide acclamation for elegantly balancing between creative imagination and scientific rationalism. A growing body of research on the Strugatsky brothers understands their legacy in a multitude of ways, as a political allegory with ideological um, <clears throat> uh, underpinnings, as a bumpy transition to postmodernity for the Soviet society, as a folk tale anchored in Russian and Soviet tradition. 
However, literary critics appear to share some common ground regarding the Strugatsky brothers, insofar as the latter appear to put forward an image for the future as a humanistic, technocratic utopia that has little or no room for the Stalinist, bigger-than-life Soviet hero. Furthermore, they have substituted class struggle for the struggle of all humankind against an increasingly hostile environment, while science's ethical dilemmas fuel almost exclusively their take on history's dialectical scheme. These principles set uh, with apocalyptic clarity the diegetic universe of roadside picnic one of the most celebrated science fiction works of the genre. Roadside Picnic is a fairly brief science fiction novel that distances itself from the rest of the genre in as much as it allows, it shows little interest in describing alien life per se. But um, the enigmatic leftovers of an alien visitation to Earth and our inability to comprehend them and their impact on our planet. There appears to be very little speculation in the novel about their identity or their purpose. Humanity is portrayed as being cynically indifferent towards the alien visitation, uh, visitation and life continues with business as usual in a self-destructive mode. One may detect an ironic intent here, directed against the conventions of the Zanr, that habitually uh, tackles the encounter with alien civilizations as a turning point, a turning point in the history of humankind. In doing so, the Strugatsky brothers shift the focus from outer space to this earthly world and from aliens to us humans, thus underscoring their essentially humanistic project. As a matter of fact, one of the narrative techniques that propel the story forward is the thematization of humanity's cognitive inadequacy. In this respect, Roadside Picnic follows the lead of Stanislav Lem's renowned Solaris, where knowledge of the world as an analytical process of noises and the corresponding primacy of scientific endeavor are constantly undermined by a worldview that foregrounds perception through censoring sensory stimuli. Lem's enigmatic complex and mutable ocean that covers the surface of planet Solaris and the cordoned off visitation zones uh, by the Strugatsky brothers constitute literary spaces that illustrate a phenomenological epochy or bracketing according to Husserl. These aspects call for a conscious suspension of established judgments before phenomena can be re-examined through the way they become manifest. Others will discuss this call as a process of defamiliarization and refamiliarization with the world. Looking at science fiction in cinema as a world building or terraforming genre alone becomes extremely problematic when it comes to pigeonholing movies such as Tarkovsky's Stalker. This can be partly attributed to Tarkovsky's special interest in the existential journey of the anti-hero that forms the backbone of Roadside Picnic and the ample counter loans from noir literature. Stalker is a borderline case of science fiction cinema inasmuch as the movie refrains from addressing any of the popular aspects of futuristic discourse. Stalker's cinematic universe is built from the material of today and speaks of the worries of our time, mainly of human alienation. Barham suggests that Tarkovsky's rhetoric is somewhat technophobic and ultimately skeptical towards modernity. 
Tarkovsky's scientific technological skepticism, which also prevails in his 1972 movie Solaris, can be construed as the cultural response to an epoch uh, that understood strict science as humanity's ultimate goal. In strict opposite to this, Tarkovsky's skepticism signposts the way for a phenomenological perspective, perspective as society's ethical imperative. The Strugatsky brothers finalized the script for Stalker in 1975, then titled, uh, titled uh, Golden Ball. Suits began uh, in 1977 in Moscow for the interiors and Tallinn, Estonia for the exteriors. exteriors. However, Tarkovsky was not happy with the final result. A year later, using the discoloration of a batch of film as an excuse, uh, he reshot the movie with a new director of photography, a new set designer, and a fresh script for which he claimed absolute ownership. The new version of the movie is a moralistic philosophical parable whose didactic message materializes within the spaces of the quarantined vegetation zone and through its processional architecture. The zone is the fourth protagonist of the movie alongside the stalker, the writer and the professor. The geography of the zone in Stalker is, a baffling, is as baffling as its literary counterpart. The audience is always kept in the dark about its location, its size, and its spatial traits. The zone could become any space, whatever and wherever, take any shape, simulate different topologies, and replicate various physical realities qualities that were despised by Soviet censorship. The cinematic description um, <clears throat> of the zone is elliptical and vague. It consists of five sequences that correspond to matching movie sets and spatial environments. Battlefield, Dry Tunnel, Mid Grinder, Sand Dunes, and finally the room that grants all wishes. This paper suggests that Tarkovsky's disjoint film sets become meaningful narrative spaces as a monumental architecture of procession. The zone is a carefully choreographed succession of exterior, interior and in-between spaces whose respective boundaries are blurred. This echoes the emphasis of the Baroque in embodied movement and spatial illusions. Due to this inherent fluidity, the zone in Stalker resounds the ontological qualities of a platonic Cora, the third kind of reality, are acceptable of becoming. Several researchers point out how the ruins in the zone create a typically Tarkovskian aesthetic of decay. For Turkovskaya, in particular, this sense of dilapidation resembles an all too familiar landscape to those who have witnessed the war. This unfavorable portrayal of the zone in relevant literature appears to overlook more charitable interpretations of the ruin and its various reconceptualizations in cultural history. The mythical landscapes of ruins constitute diachronic lands of legend and history where the colloquial and the mundane interweave with the magical, the mysterious, the uncanny and the sublime. They are uh, places of condensed experience where the past becomes manifest in the present as a folk tale, fable or even nightmare. Ruins present in tangible form the layering of time and the palimpsest of history. Their tactility makes the past more malleable and enables its instrumentalization. Ruins, the special imprints of now lost material totalities that hold immense aesthetic surplus value, have played different roles in different times. Symbolic, ideological, social, psychological, political, and so on. 
The origin of humanity's interest in ruins can be traced to the Italian Renaissance and more specifically to Petrarch's letter of 1341 to his friend Colonna, which describes their casual strolls amidst the ruinous antiquities of Rome. This interest involve, evolves into a field of rigorous research during the 19th century when the nascent disciplines of history and archaeology and the systematization of scientific excavations began to regulate our relation to the past. However, it was not until Greek and Roman antiquity, it was not only, sorry, Greek and Roman antiquity that captured humanity's imagination anymore, but the more recent ruins of the Middle Ages that became the focus of deliberation by such prominent thinkers, such as Ruskin and Viollet le Duc. Their work set the foundation for romanticism, ambivalence, and oscillation between two extremes, preservation of the ruin in a ruinous state and creative restoration. The apparently unbridgeable distance between the ruinous and the restored ruin forms a constitutional part of the aesthetic appeal of ruins, which according to Benjamin emerged even earlier in the 17th and 18th centuries due to the Baroque. Baroque architecture invested in the intrinsic melancholy of the ruin, the sad realization that the past and its essential substance have been irrevocably lost. Ruins mark the space of this absence. They represent a rift with the present. The fragment of the ruinous ruin recalls the loss of a sought after totality that now, that now inhabits the nebulous landscapes of myth and history. In short, ruins facilitate daydreaming. And I think dream and reverie is a recurring theme in this conference and I'm very glad about this. Industrial ruins, such as the carcasses of former power plants that, and dams that form the cinematic backgrounds and props in uh, Stalker, qualify as particular species of ruination. For instance, abandoned factories do not play a significant role in nation-forming processes, such as constructing national identities, despite the recent emergence in, of industrial archaeology as a humanistic discipline. These humble and mostly unassuming cells of industrial heritage from the previous century cannot compete with the ornate monuments of the recent, of the recent and distant, uh, distant past. However, despite their potential banality, they constitute silent witnesses of a lived past that allows for less institutionalized encounters with otherness. In this sense, investing industrial ruins with aesthetic value can be construed as nothing short of a revolutionary act, an act of defiance against the systematic depreciation of our times for things that appear to have no clear-cut, tangible and objectified use. Hence, the utopian <clears throat> trope of Tarkovsky's project. Industrial ruins are not vacant, outdated, valueless, perilous, or meaningless spaces. They constitute social condensers that have temporarily suspended their functions. They inhabit an uncharted territory between per per purposefulness and purposelessness, life and oblivion. Industrial ruins, similarly to the zone in Stalker, stand for a promise full of threatening and or extraordinary prospects. This ambivalence, framed within the melancholy of the fragment, is responsible for the magical, mystical, and utopian attributes of the zone in Tarkovsky's Stalker. In conclusion, the zone in Stalker appears to have always been there on that earth and under that sky, so there is nothing utopian about it, functioning, though, as a temporal, uh, temporal repository, a Foucauldian heterotopia of time. Accumulation of time is manifest in the presence of various decaying cinematic props, such as abandoned buildings or rusting machinery. An aesthetic of decay 
that has contributed to the unfavorable portrayal of the zone in relevant literature. However, decay is not merely a destructive process that leads to death, but a natural process that celebrates the circle of life and the temporality of our future existence. Because of this decay, humans may experience the passing of time. This becomes particularly true in the timeless landscape of the zone where time resists rests sorry within every rusty piece of metal every moldy uh, and damp, dampened wall every rotten piece of wood there in their decay lies condensed time passed in a tangible form against which the political regime was always very skeptical about thank you for your attention Thank you so much, Mr. Eli Fragis. Stalker is always so fascinating topic. So now we'll proceed.